If you do not understand white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you do understand will confuse you. In all of these nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, anywhere on the planet, minute by minute, day by day, all of the time, all of the time, all of the time. All right. Good morning, Grand Rising. Hello, whatever you'd like to be acknowledged. Welcome to another edition, the June the 8th, 2021 edition of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. And I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. As usual, the contact numbers for the show is 516 516- Four five three nine nine two one. Be sure to de- to depress the number one button if you have a call or comment. And I would ask, ma'am or sir, please keep your questions uh, short and to the point, so that Mr. Fuller can fully answer your question. You can also gmail me at the numeral seven, Mr. Bobby B O B B Y at gmail.com, and I would ask the same there. Please do not write me a novel, because I simply, because of radio time, I cannot read that like that. So make it short and sweet, so that Mr. Fuller, again, can get the question and um, may answer it in an appropriate manner. See, all the books are in. That's good. Chat room is now open. A. Sankof is in the house this morning. We'll have others in there, and we do appreciate that. Special hello to my uh, brother, Skip Young. He's listening down in Florida. Aaron in Spain, as a matter of fact, excuse me, in France. We have a lot of people worldwide that listen to the program, and we do appreciate that. Okay, let's start. And uh, Oh, yeah, special hello To the Moon Pie, him and his brother Robert make sure that Mr. Fuller and I stay where we need to stay up on it. And if anything happens, they inform us and let us know so that we can present a straight program. So I want to acknowledge Moon Pie. And Sharon, if she's listening, she filled in for Robert and Moon Pie when they had a situation in their family. And you couldn't even tell she was so good, so special. Thanks to her. Okay, again, now, when you call in, as uh, this person in the 404 and in the 201, make sure you give the call screen your name so that I may so I may properly introduce you. Okay, let's start off by saying good morning to Mr. Fuller. Good morning, Mr. Fuller, and how are you? Good morning. I'm still learning. Okay, let's start off with a Gmail. Thank you, Stan, in Pennsylvania. Uh, let's start off with a uh, Gmail here. This comes from Mr. Duncan. He says, Mr. Fuller, why has the white supremacist system begin to loosen up on laws that have inc- incarcerated non-white people for longer drug drug sentences? Why has the white supremacist system begin to legalize drugs that have been illegal for so long? Well, I don't know. But according to what I have written, and according to compensatory counter-racist logic, it's uh, logical or reasonable to make an assumption that to the extent that the white supremacists have anything to do with anything, that black people do or don't do, the victims of white supremacy, it has to do with giving strength to the system of white supremacy. That's the logical assumption all the time. That's what the business of white supremacy is all about, dominate and mistreat people of color in order to get what everybody wants 
in different forms, I mean, and the way they go about getting it, all creatures want is fun, glory, and material comfort. And somebody thought of something called racism as a way of getting it. And it turned out to be the most powerful political and religious force among the people of the known universe in recorded history that ever was. It's the most powerful of mistreating people and dominating people on the basis of color is the most powerful political and religious system ever produced in the minds of people in recorded history. And it's for those purposes, fun, glory, and material comfort. So if they're releasing prisoners or they're going among black people and saying, okay, well, we prohibited you from using drugs. Now, it's okay to use them. Use all you want. And uh, that we're, we're, we're going to help you out now. We've done things to harm you. Now we're going to repair the harm by uh, we brought the drugs to you. And uh, that was a mistake. And so uh, for when we start punishing you for using what we brought to you, and so now we're not going to punish you anymore. Oh, you're free to use them. So if that's what they're saying now, if that is exactly what is going on, it's still just another way that they're going to have of dominating and mistreating people of color. Because the question is going to be, as always, does it have a constructive effect? Anything that anybody does on the planet when they are trying to help you, they don't do anything when they when they get you involved that's going to have a non-constructive effect. So if people are trying to help you and they give you something, no matter what it is or what it is, all starts out to be on the surface, if it has a non-constructive effect directly, indirectly, then you can say that that person intended to harm you, particularly if the person has a position of power and a position of knowing better. Okay. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Five one six four five three nine nine two one is the number you call to get in contact with the program. You're listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, or we sometimes call it the C R C S. Thank you, Jane Lance, Skip Ye- Skip Young and Aaron in um France. And we will soon get to Stan and then Gregory in Florida and the person that just called into the six uh, five one area code. Be sure to give this caller your uh, your name so that we can um, so that when I get to you that I can call you out properly. Mr. Fuller, this comes from Mr. Barrington. He says this, Mr. Fuller. I do recall you saying in a recent broadcast that since you have heard people say words to the effect, quote, the next generation won't stand for this racism. End of quote. As a black male in my 40s, I hear the same nonsense today. Mr. Fuller, please, could you talk about dispelling this myth that racism will somehow end with the next generation because I have even heard refined white supremacists using the same pattern of speech. This comes from Mr. Barrington in England. What has never happened so far, that's the evidence. As far back as I can remember, the next generation will take care of it. The next generation, the next generation, the next generation. That's a recipe for laziness. That's what it sounds like to me. Next generation will take care of it. Oh, we can't do nothing now. 
But the next generation, oh, they are rising. How many sermons you hear like that? On and on and on. Always something projected somewhere in the future. Right around the corner now, sometimes. Sometimes in the far uh, future. But sometimes they say it's going to be immediate. It won't be long now. It won't be long now. We're almost at the end of the road. I mean, it's about to happen any day now. I mean, just hold your breath. And they say, well, what about today? You have today. That's the compensatory codified response. You have this minute. This minute. What are you doing with this minute? The person doing all this talking about the future generation. What are you doing right this minute? Because somebody said that you were the future generation. And then of what's going to be passed on is just generation after generation talking about the next generation. The next generation. What about this moment right now with you? Are you doing anything now that should be done to correct whatever needs to be corrected? And if you are, enumerate rather than gathering everybody around you and talk about the next generation to take care of it. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. So the cold position is the compensatory counter of science is stop doing it. Stop talking about the next generation to take care of anything. Start saying the next generation is now. I'm it. End of the line. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not looking for the next generation to do nothing. I'm supposed to do it all, period, all, A-L-L. That's what we need right this minute. Among people like who? Whom? However you want to say it. Me. Neely Fuller, Jr., If I don't take care of everything right now, then I have failed in the reason for me being here in the first place. That's it. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Again, the person in the uh, 651, please give your uh, name so that I can properly introduce you as I go to Stan in Pennsylvania. Good morning, Stan, and welcome. You can be heard. You were on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, just wanted to say well, what Mr. Fuller just said is correct, and it's like that short poem, you know, as it is to be, it's up to me. And that's how I, that's how I live my life, you know, I just look at it like that. Um, so thank you for saying that. But the, the question that I had is um, I wanted to ask Mr. Fuller, sir, um, did you ever read – Mind of the South by W.J. Cash. The book came out in 1941. And if you did read it, what did you think about it? And if you did not read it, would you be able to talk about an, maybe another book that you have read in your life that had a profound effect on you or maybe gave you some insight that you previously didn't know that um, maybe changed your view of things? And I'd like to stay on the line for the uh, question. Already? For the answer. Uh-huh. I've heard of the book, but I never read it. That's number one. Okay. Number two, everything that I've ever read, including just the daily paper, including some comics, comic books. I used to be a comic book addict when I was, I'll say, seven, nine, ten years old. I used to have stacks of comic books. Everything I've ever read, uh, influence me in some way or another everything i've ever heard and that's a part of the codified process Uh, just because something is between two covers doesn't say that it's not universal Uh, just whatever happens to strike your mind i've read a whole lot of pages where i didn't recall what i read i mean most of what i've read i don't recall or what book i read it in But everything I have ever looked at has had an influence 
on how I think. And I think that's really true of everyone, whether you're aware of it or not. You never know when you're being influenced. There are things that I was exposed to, and I'm looking at it, and I didn't make any interpretation at all. But then years passed, and I thought back, and then I realized that I was influenced without knowing that I was being influenced. In fact, uh, the sergeant that I sometimes talk about, that I talked about philosophy and different things with them every now and then, and uh, I once made the remark to him, I said, yeah, because he was asking me about something, I said, well, my teachers didn't teach me anything like that. In fact, my teachers didn't teach me much or nothing because I was angry. And I just blurted out those two statements. And he said, now you just said something that's not true. And then I paused and he paused and he said, I can tell by some of the things that you say that your teachers, whomever they were, taught you a whole lot. You just didn't know that you were learning. And I thought about that, and that was true. That statement that he made. <laughs> that sometimes you are learning, but you don't know that you're learning. Sometimes you're being taught, and you don't know that you're being taught. Your, your mind just doesn't work that way. But when he made that statement, the realization hit me, he's correct. I was learning, but I didn't know that I was learning. <laughs> and that's true even today. So in answer to the question, everything, every time I've looked, you know, sometimes I can think of things now, even if with as old as I am, with one foot in the grave right now, I can think of things that influenced me that I didn't know I was being influenced. It goes way back, way back. Just like what I was thinking the first time I saw a, a terrapin, as they call them in those days. I don't know the species, but it's something like turtles. And I'd see them, they were always around the grapevines. And I hated to go among the grapevines because there's plenty of them there. And I always thought they were going to bite me when I was real young. I mean, they had, they, they looked like turtles, but they were on land. And very, and they were around grapes or berries or cherries or anything like that. There would be a lot of them. Uh, had black dots with yellow circles, if I remember, on their backs. They looked very strange, and they looked kind of threatening. And I always thought they were going to bite me when I was very, very young. But, uh, you know, these things impress on my mind. Sometimes I can see them now. Sometimes you're being influenced, and you don't know you're being influenced, like the sergeant said. So in answer to the question, so many books, fiction books that I've read, they're passages, sometimes just one or two lines that stick with you and give you a picture in your mind that sticks with you, that kind of photographs reality. And you connect that with something else that connects with something else that connects with something else. Because even though books have covers, you open them from the first page and then you close them from the last page. But actually books just go on and on and on. In fact, there's a Bible statement that says, I think, of a making of many books, there is no end. Okay. Alrighty. 
Thank you, Stan, and I will keep you on the line. You are listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., CRCS, is another way that we call the show. You can uh, dial 516-453-9921 with a question or comment. Please, ma'am, please, sir, keep it short. And hopefully we'll get a chance to get to you as we try to mix in a couple of Gmails. But right now, we are going to the great state of Florida where we find Gregory. Gregory, you are now on with Mr. Neely Fuller. Good morning, and what is your question? Good morning. Gregory? Going once, Gregory? Okay, I uh, don't have you on here. Let's go to Minneapolis, and it says here Mermaid. So let's see here. Um, see if I can get you in here. Mermaid? I'm um, having a little problem here. Hmm, can't get Gregory from Florida and can't get Mermaid in here. I'm going to try one more one more time here. Let me see here. Okay. Hmm. Can't get you in here. Well, let me just do this here. Mr. Fuller, this comes from Angelus. He says this, Dear Mr. Fuller, Jr., normally you say that the system of white supremacy is a prison, and what we call prison within the system is greater confinement. My question is, if you're a prisoner of white supremacy system prison, but also have to contend with people who've been to greater confinement, who live and act as if they're still in greater confinement, even though they're in public with the rest of us in prison and other prisoners test other prisoners' temperament or fighting skills, I find that most of the time other non whites are always seeking to provoke an aggressive response from me by taunting in one way or another. What is the best way to deal with these people? The best way to deal with anybody in the system of white supremacy. You, uh, the code book says, you minimize conflict of any kind by doing what? Minimizing contact, all non-constructive contact. But if you're around people all the time, you're forced to be around them, you just go silent about most things. That's one way of breaking contact with people. And the only time you engage is when something constructive is going on. Now, if people say things to so-called provoke you and all like that, the code says, Anybody who wants to call your name or make fun of you or anything like that, go right ahead, white or non-white. That's that's a part of the war. There's no way to escape it. There's no way to escape the war that you're in. And as a prisoner of war, you have to put up with this. This, this is the burden that's put on all of us as victims of white supremacy. So we can't expect a whole lot of pleasant things to happen in our existence here on the planet. Black people are expecting to be happy in a situation that's not designed to produce happiness. Now, they say in the Constitution or in some written documents here and there and whatnot, the pursuit of happiness, well, you can pursue it. But you got to understand that in the system of white supremacy, you're not even supposed to be happy anytime. That's one thing black people really have to understand. Happiness is really out of place completely. It's weird. In a system that's designed to produce non-constructive results, evil results. Unhappiness mm-hmm. is designed to produce that. So if you're trying to be happy in a situation that's designed to produce non-happiness, you're already in an insane situation 
And you're just adding to it by that expectation. You should not expect to be happy at any time. If you happen to be happy, which is why they call it happiness, according to the code, logically speaking, happiness happens. You have no way of knowing when it's going to come or how fast it's going to leave, because that's how it happens. It happens really in moments. That's how happiness happens. It happens in moments. And just about the time you reach up to grab it, try to hold on to it and keep it there, it's gone. But the thing about it, it does come again. But I have discovered that happiness comes in moments. There's no such thing as you reach a, a certain plateau and you're happy ever after. That's what I was taught in the storybooks uh, in elementary school. You go through a lot of this and a lot of that and some of the other, and then you get to the top of the hill, you might say, and you look down in the valley, and that valley is nothing but happiness. You just walk down the hill casually, and everything on your way down into that valley, happiness valley, and all the trees and birds and whatnot are singing, and everything is happy. Nothing unfortunate happens. That's what we are taught in elementary school, many of us. I was taught that, that you reach a certain stage of your existence. And then if everything works out in combination like it should, you do this, you do that, and whatnot, then you have happiness and you have it forever. That's never been in the known universe, regardless of whom you may be how much money you have or don't have, how many things you possess, how many friends you so-called have, what your health condition is. Happiness only comes in moments. I have discovered that. Okay. Let's do this before we go to a commercial. This comes from Victor Palmer. The uh, people area activity, the people activity area of economics of white supremacy. He says this, VGQ. The consumption of the dead black male bodies in a slavery context is an operation of the business in white supremacy. The mistreating, dominating, and subjugating non-white peoples based on their color is justifiable by their religion of white supremacy because white supremacy is their God. That comes from Victor Palmer of Canada. You're listening to the Counter-Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. And if you would like to get in contact with the show, just simply dial 516 453 Nine nine two one. You can also Gmail me at the numeral seven, Mr. Bobby B O B B Y at Gmail dot com. That Gmail, by the way, will probably not be read today, but it'll be stacked up with the others, and at a certain time, it will be read. When you do decide to call in, depress the number one button so that if you have a call or comment, you can do that. And please, ma'am, please, sir, make that call or comment short so that Mr. Fuller can address that question. And please give your name, as Raymond did in Georgia. Gregory's on the line, and then we also have Mermaid back. So we will get to the show. You're listening, again, to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. and co-host Mr. Bobby. Thank you for listening. Okay, let's go to the six. Five one area, and I'm told that Mermaid is back. So, Mermaid, good morning, and how are you? You can be heard. What is your question for Mr. Fuller? Yes, good morning, Mr. Bob or Mr. Fuller. Good morning. Um, I have um, good morning. Yes, I have a question. Okay, so I was listening to Mr. Fuller's broadcast from June 23rd, 2020, and someone asked if the white supremacists behave the way they behave due to having animal DNA, and Mr. Fuller replied, "He don't know." 
and he's heard that about black and white people, but just because there's no evidence, he doesn't know. And he said not, um, it's not right. I mean, we really can't say that about one group of people. And then he said all people on this earth is flawed due to white supremacy. And I kind of took that as, um, and I could be wrong, that Mr. Fuller was basically making it like the victims of white supremacy are just as guilty as the perpetrators of white supremacy and not acknowledging that um, behavioral difference between the perpetrators of white supremacy and the victims of white, white supremacy kind of like um, grouping us together, like we're all um, guilty in all of this. Um, so I just want to ask Mr. Um, um, Fuller, um, do is there – a distinct difference between those who perpetrate it and those who are victims? And is it fair for us just to bunch everybody together, like, oh, we're all guilty, when that there are true predators of um, perpetrators of white supremacy? Thank you. Well, if I understand the question, victims of white supremacy are victims. So the only thing we are guilty of is just being victims of white supremacy, if you call that guilt. But we were born in the system of white supremacy, the prison system of white supremacy. So we're not guilty of anything. The only thing except whatever we do is a result of the system of white supremacy. We've never known anything else. There's nothing outside of that. If you're black and you're on a planet called Earth, you're subject to the system of white supremacy, and that's all you have ever known as prisoners of war. So you know what prisoners of war are, or prisoners of any kind. Prisoners act like prisoners. So if you study the pattern of prison behavior, uh, it fits. We fit that qualification, and we don't fit any other qualification. That's why I say that black people have nothing to brag about. We're born in a prison camp. And whatever you do in a prison camp, it doesn't mean anything. Because the major thing in your entire existence is you're a prisoner of war. Your existence takes on meaning within that, what you might call the logical context, the most productive context. You begin to evolve into what you should be a quality person, and the ultimate would be universal man, universal woman, with all of the best qualities that are in the universe in yourself as people. We are nowhere. And when I say we, I mean the non-white people of this planet. Nowhere in that neighborhood of being universal man and universal woman. Because we're in a system of white supremacy, and everything about it is designed not to produce universal man, universal woman. Meaning what? People who are in harmony. People who do not mistreat anyone under any circumstance. People who help people who need help the most. These are the main qualities of universal man, universal woman. The white supremacists don't have these qualities. So copying them, no, heaven forbid. They don't even intend to be. They glorify death. And that's one thing that has got to go. In fact, black people shouldn't even be celebrating anything with all the death that goes on among black people themselves. The gold says shouldn't be any celebration of anything. At least, at the very least, until there's absolutely no report of any black person killing anybody unjustified. No, no, no record of that at all where that happens, anywhere on the planet, any time of day or night. But we are just like the white supremacists when it comes to killing. We just brush that off and say, hey, that's business as usual. I mean, killing, killing, people killing people. I mean, murder. The white supremacists glorify it. They relish in it. That's why they are such 
great lovers of weapons, uh, the ones that they like to talk about and collect more than anything, the type of instruments. It's something that makes more and more death and makes a whole lot of it real fast. A one-shot rifle is kind of looked down on as compared to a rifle that will shoot 800 shots in a short amount of time and hopefully kill 800 people. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. Got to have five and six of them. Oh, no, five and six hundred. Oh, no, five and six thousand. What, are you going to use them for that? Well, I hope so. Why do you think I got them? Mass insanity. Mass insanity. Well, who are you going to kill? Well, somebody. What do you think I got all these guns for? At least I can imagine that I might kill them even if I don't get around to doing it. Collect some more. Hmm. Okay. That's the kind of world we're in. Yes, sir. All righty. Thank you, uh, Mermaid, for your um, question, and do not be a stranger. Uh, Mr. Fuller, speaking, speaking of death and mass, Insanity, as you just stated. Brother Lou Lungizi from the concept called South Africa said this. I hope you're doing well, Mr. Fuller. Some time ago, African leaders, if I may use the concept leader, took a decision to make Africa a nuclear-free zone, which means that they committed to never to develop nuclear weapons. My question is, should non-white countries develop nuclear weapons for defense purposes, given the fact that the white countries already have them. Enjoy the rest of your day, Mr. Fuller. Regards from South Africa. Well, that's for them to determine according to their circumstances. If they see that they may need them or they perceive that that's what the future is going to uh, require in order to have the most what? constructive results, then that's what they should do. But if they look around and say, we're not going to be able to do that and do it better than what they're doing anyway. So if we acquire them and start talking about trying to use them, we're going to lose. So you don't ever want to do anything where you set yourself up to be a loser. So that's about all far as I can go in saying that. Uh, all righty. It's, right, it's, that, it's just like an individual person, whether or not you should carry a gun. It's no different. It's the same basic mm-hmm. thing. It has to do with, well, if I carry one, will it, in some circumstances, be of service to me, depending on what those circumstances are, or... If I carry one, will it bring about something unpleasant for me faster than something that's pleasant? And so you make that assessment based on your circumstances. Am I, by carrying a gun, will that produce a constructive result for me most likely than not carrying one? So you you have to make that determination according to your perceived circumstances. It's no different whether you're talking about a knife, a sword, or a nuclear device of some type, explosive mm-hmm. device. Oh, ready? Let's go to the two zero one, and that would be Gregory in Florida. Wait a minute. Okay, yeah, Gregory in Florida. Good morning. You're on with Mr. Fuller. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Fuller, um, if we use using logic, um, if people are constantly killing you and want you to be happy and have a history of doing all the things that they've done to us, and would you say that they are the devil? 
white people, the white man is the devil for everything he's done to us and can, can he continues to do and we have to try to convince them to change or persuade them or cope with them? Do you think they're the devil? Well, I don't know exactly what the devil is. And then as the far person, as the code is I would, concerned I would, about I would about, define the devil as the person who causes you to go through hell. Well, I don't know what hell is like. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> there, there are all kind of fantasies about it. They say somebody is standing there with a big fork, and you know, and and a long tail. And they got a big furnace, and they keep shoveling people in it. That's what it's like. <laughs> I don't know, uh, and I don't know but what I'm the fork is like for. We, we go through so much hell. We go through so much hell with them. Like it's, it's like wow. It's like. We have to try to convince them to change. And I'm like, will they ever change? I mean, I don't know if they have the capability of change. Uh, well, I have seen people who have changed, you know, but that's circumstantial. People change all the time, every fraction of a second. You start changing even in, in the womb. You're evolving. So that's a change. But you are heading toward death. The minute you are conceived, so where's the cutoff point? I mean, you know, so you only go by what people actually do. The code says you don't call people names, so I don't call white people devils, any kind of name. You don't call, I don't call anybody any kind of name. I'm prohibited by the code from doing so, except the name that they want to be called. Now, a lot of white people have said. They want to be called white supremacists. But then when I start calling them that, they changed and said they want to be called white nationalists. Say, well, I made a mistake when I said supreme. No, I, I didn't quite mean that. I mean, uh, that, that that came out. Uh, you know, uh, I, I said that I believed in white supremacy at one time. But I'm not saying that now. Uh, I do believe in white preservation. I believe in uh, uh, oh white nationalism, you know, just preserving my whiteness. Well, that's not what you said the first time, all right? Because, I mean, I'm under the system of white supremacy, so if you're not a white supremacist, sir, you believe in white nationalism, well, you tell me what is white nationalism. Because the people who come up with a phrase or a word are the people who should define it. Just like I asked about the definition of devil. All right, if a person calls themselves a devil, or if they call me one, I don't want to know the first thing, who said it. I want to know, is is it true? And the only way I can find out if it's true is to know what it is. What What is a devil? What does a devil do? And how much? I mean, by that person's definition. Everybody might have a different definition. I understand there are different tribes throughout the world, many millions of tribes, and all of them have some type of concept, I've heard, or most of them, or some of them, of a supreme evil force. But they have their own idea about what that force is. Mm-hmm. Mr. Fuller, you start this process by asking questions, correct? Yes, I do. All okay. problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. Yeah, I noticed as you were going, you were asking a question. What is the devil? And then let this person What is the tell devil? You. Yes, the person who is saying, who mentions the devil, has to describe what a devil, what you know, what a devil looks like. If it has a look, the devil may not even have a look. It may be some type of force that just mm -hmm. appears somewhere and things start happening. Uh, some people say that that's what it is. It's a spirit. It doesn't take any mm -hmm. shape or form. I mean, it just, it just goes around and creeps into things. Mm -hmm. and then but if they say that, on. but if they say that, then you would ask them, then what is a spirit, perhaps? Yes, yes. Okay. You always keep asking. Keep Whatever people have asked me down through the years. Well, well, how do you know what word to use when you're getting close to running out of words to describe what you're trying to describe? 
I say, well, you just go by the last word of whatever the person said. But you keep asking, because as long as you're using a word, you should be able to describe what the word means. Yes, sir. Okay. All righty. Gregory from Florida, thank you so much for your uh, question. And the routine is, don't be a stranger. Mr. Fuller, we've been speaking for almost an hour, and we've been speaking in or around and about your book. This is the time where we designate for you to speak about your book, the name of it, and who the book is designed for. So take it away, Mr. Fuller. The name of the book is the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. A bunch of words that mean absolutely nothing until you look in the book and see what the words mean because they are described at the beginning of the book. The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. Now, that sounds real sophisticated and sounds, in some people's minds, kind of heavy and unnecessary. And so I tried to be more explicit. So actually, the title of the book has titles of the book, or or threesome, you might say. The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, that's the main title. And then a more explicit title, it's a compensatory counter-racist code, a counter-racist code a code that's designed to counter racism. Code meaning something that you do and don't do. That should work against racism. And it's compensatory, meaning it's making up for the lack of a code that doesn't exist now, which is why I wrote it. I say that black people need a code, non-white people, because the white supremacists have a code. That's why they're successful. Anything that works or any people who adopt some type of code for what they do and don't do and stick with it will determine what's going to happen to those people. And people who have a code of some type are usually more distinctive and have more power than people who don't have one. People who just run around doing a little bit of anything and everything and don't know what to do, I mean, and don't really care, they're going to come under the domination if the people who choose to dominate them, they're going to come under the domination of people who have a code. Because the code means you know the do's and don'ts of what will work and what will not work. Because that's all the code is. You have a code that doesn't work if you have adopted it. And then there are people who have a code that we don't do nothing that doesn't work. I mean, you know, we'll try something. If it doesn't work, we're not doing that no more. You know, we tried and tried again. That's what the white supremacists have done. So they have the most powerful code of any people on the planet uh, in recorded history. And they did it in record time. And they have an exact way of going about doing everything and an exact way of not going about doing a whole list of things. Black people don't have anything similar to that. We just wake up in the morning and stretch and yawn and do what we have been trained to do, wait around for somebody to tell us what to do, what to care about, what not to care about, what the latest thing is, uh, who to kill, who not to kill, what makes a person an enemy, what person makes a person a friend. I mean, how to talk, how to walk, how to act, how not to act. We leave that to somebody else. And that's why we're in such disarray when you don't have a code. The white supremacists have one. You can get the code book, the counter-racist code, 
and I'll give the third title, a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and our action for victims of white supremacy, which is racism. So only one form of racism, and that is white supremacy. That itself is a code. There are people who will say, oh, no, they're all forms of racism. No. The counter-racist code says just one form of racism, and that's white supremacy. None other. There's no other form at all, period. That's absolute. See, codes are about absolutes. Black people don't have absolutes. We have a head-scratching Negro-type way of existing on the planet, which is why we are the scorn of the entire world. We don't have absolutes about anything. We guess about everything and then start trying to use our brain after we did some very sloppy guessing, which is why we're in shape we're in. We yes, need sir. an exact code. We can get it by going to ProduceJustice.com. Okay. ProduceJustice.com. Already, ProduceJustice.com, 516-453-9921 is the number that you call to get in contact with the show with a question or comment for Mr. Fuller. Please, ma'am, please, sir, make it short and sweet. When you do call in, make sure you depress the number one button and give your name. I need this person in the 832 to please give your name before I go to Raymond. Okay, John. Thank you, John. Got you together, John and Houston. Um, Mr. Fuller, before we go to Raymond here, you always uh, have said in a couple of programs to uh, make a will. And then I found an article in um, the May the May, May 2021 edition of the AARP Bulletin, page 26, on how to be a good executor by Sharon Walter Walters in the uh, Your Money section. Now, you always have – well, I've heard you sp- speak or address that make a will, uh, and this um, – I read a little bit of this article, and it will give you – or give us some pointers on – what to do on to be an executor and to take care of that. Uh, we don't seem to do that. I will probably be mentioning that again. But how to be a good executor by Sharon Walters in the Your Money section of the May edition of the AARP Bulletin, page number 26. Okay, let's do this. Let's go to the 646, and we got Raymond in Georgia. Let me see. Raymond, we got you in here, Raymond. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, morning, morning, morning. Um, my thought is that the world is saying going back to normal. I'm asking Mr. Fuller now, what is his thought or what is his response when someone say, they would like a victim, victim or prisoner of war say, going back to normal? I'll take my listener for the ear. Okay, thank you. Going back to normal. Thank you, Raymond. He's going to listen yes, off sir. the air. Mr. Fuller, what is he? I guess he's saying, what does that mean to you or... What is that, going back to, quote, quote, going back to normal? What does that mean in, I don't know. in this system? I don't know. It depends on who's doing the talking. Here again is an example of the use of words. What normal is to one person may be extremely abnormal or subnormal, or above normal, or whatever, to someone else. So a person should always ask. If a person says, well, we're trying to get back to normal. When a person says that, sir, ma'am, ask politely, what exactly is normal? And and if you're talking about people activity, and then you name the nine areas as outlined in the textbook, what is exactly normal in economics? What is normal in education? I'm giving it to you in alphabetical order, the nine areas of activity in the textbook. Mm -hmm. What is exactly is normal in the field of economics? in the area of activity, the use of time and energy called economics. 
what exactly is normal in education, in entertainment, in labor, in law, in politics, in religion, in sex, in war. So when you ask those questions about all those areas of activity, try to have enough time to sit down and get all answers. So you'll know what that person means when that person said normal, getting back to normal. What is normal? In all of those areas of activity, that's what you want to know. So that you will have what? An understanding. So that you'll have all your questions answered about what normal is according to that person. Because somebody standing next to that person might have a long list of what's normal that's completely different from what that person you're talking to now has. Mm -hmm. So you always want to know from the person who used the word what the word means and how it's applied in every area of activities, which is getting what you call understanding. We need to get in the habit of that, understanding what a person is saying. Because people talk all the time, do a whole lot of talking, and talk fast, too. Just slow them down. That's the first thing. You want to know what every one of those words they just threw out there meant, particularly in this day and time where most people talk real fast, real fast. Just throw out words by the bucket. And what you do is slow them down. Like in a courthouse, they slow you down. Wait a minute, wait a minute, get on the stand. Explain exactly what do you mean by interpretation. You've used that word here in this courtroom, and if we have to stay here for 40 days and 40 nights just dealing with that one word, that's what we're going to do. There's a reason for that. That's how you get to the truth. Don't get lost in words. Mm -hmm. Don't get lost in words. Even uh, do you expect that same type of questioning to be used against you? Oh, sure, it should be. But it's not against me. That's how you get to the truth. So if somebody asks you, what what do you mean by when you say truth, what would you respond if they ask you that, truth is that which is. I go to. Uh, that's why I got a word guide. So you have to make up definitions, or you better get one. If if you don't accept the one, one like they're used in most dictionaries, or mm-hmm. you can specify what you mean, then you come up with definitions of your own. I came I up see. with a definition of justice, that you won't find in any book. I don't think, other than mine. But when I use it. If I went to court today, see, I'm talking about things to do and things not to do right yes, now. Sir. If I went into a courtroom right this minute, got off this phone, and 15 minutes later I was across town in some courtroom here in Washington, D.C., and so the judge asked me, well, how do you see justice? Because this is a court of justice. I would give them the compensatory definition right out of my book, not the dictionary definition, Mm -hmm. or whatever the definition is in a book called Black's Law Dictionary. I understand there is a legal book. Yes, there is. uh, There's a book called Black's Law, Yes. interesting enough, dictionary here in the Northwestern Hemisphere. I've never seen the book. Where can I, I get even, that word guide at? Oh, the word guide, my word guide, you can get by going to ProduceJustice.com. Okay, and that's where we're going to leave it for right now because we are out of time for the first hour. For those that have to go, thank you for listening to the first hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller. We will try to be better the next time. But for those of you who are holding on in the chat room and calls, <laughs> We got you all covered here on the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, which will commence, or we will start again in about 10 seconds. Thank you for listening. Good 
morning. You are listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. By the way, we're not going to commence, as I erroneously said, we're going to commence this second hour of the Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. I am your co host, Mr. Bobby, full of mistakes, but nevertheless, here we are. To get in contact with the show today, Call this number, 516-453-9921, and be sure to depress the number one button, as John has done in Houston, which we will get to in momentarily. Um, and be sure, ma'am, be sure, sir, when you do that, uh, make sure that uh, you do not be long with your statement or your question so that Mr. Fuller can fully answer that. You can also gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y at gmail.com. It will not be read today, I don't think, but it will be read on a, another program or another time slot, and I will, as usual, contact you and let you know the date and time when it will be read. You can also go to the chat room, which is open, Al Freedom is, is in there. Uh, A. Sankofas 777 is in the house. Be Good 1 is in there. Comments are all in there, and um, you can do it. Press or depress. Somebody's laughing. That's Be Good. How about how about both the press? <laughs> be Good 1. Anyway, press the button. Okay, how's that sound? Just press the button if you want to be heard, and Mr. Fuller will get a chance to uh, answer your question. Please, ma'am. Please, sir. Okay, let's do this here. Oh, by the way, that person just hit the, in the five six two. Don't forget to give them your uh, your name so that I can properly introduce you when your time comes. Okay, we can do that. All right, let's go commence <laughs> with the uh, second part of the show. This is from Diva two twenty four. Mister Fuller says this, Mister Fuller. What was the motivating factor for you to study racism and write the compensatory code? Necessity. I was, uh, the, the make a parable, if anybody's familiar with the Andy Griffith show, uh, goes back some years, you probably see reruns on television and whatnot. There's a character... Uh, law enforcement officer there in a small town called Mayberry called Barney Fife. <laughs> now, that was me. I was Barney Fife when it came to a whole bunch of things. I, I was all, you know, <laughs> bug-eyed and wondering about everything that's going on. Everything threw me off. I was, I was confused about just about anything that would come up. I was uh, a real case study in confusion. I was asked millions of questions, but nobody else would ask any. Why? Because I was the most confused person in the bunch. So about the mid-1950s, I got tired of being confused about everything. And so what is the antidote for confusion questions so for you need to question everything and then don't walk away until you get answers to the questions that's the formula and i stumbled up on that with the help of a black sergeant who was always telling me pay attention to details pay attention to things pay attention to your surroundings Ask questions about why this and why that. And full of that's how you become intelligent, and that's how you get rid of confusion. Because confusion is the handmaiden of non intelligence. The two go together. You become an intelligent person by not being confused. That's what intelligence is. Not confused, knowing what's going on and why. The more you know and understand, the less confused you are, and therefore the more intelligent you become. So 
intelligence is nothing but just getting rid of confusion and putting it in those simple terms. I picked up on that. And then I said, yeah. And how do I go about doing this? Asking questions about everything, even if you just ask yourself and try to find the correct answer because that's all education is finding the correct answer to everything that's going on around you so that you are never confused about anything and you become an intelligent person automatically. You know, we call it being dumb and all like that, but we don't describe what that means. You say, oh, you're nothing but a big dummy. So in answer to the question, this is what it was, and this is how it all evolved with the code. And this particular black sergeant, I was in Japan at the time. I hated to see him coming because he's always <laughs> on point. So he's always going to talk about something serious, never no foolishness. See, when the foolishness starts, that's when he'd walk off. He wouldn't say anything. He'd just walk off. He didn't have time for nonsense at all, period. He didn't believe in it. He thought it was, you know, nonsense was just that. It was just a complete waste of time. And he was a stickler about time and how to use your time and energy. He felt like your mind should be working all the time. Your mind doesn't take a day off and working in your favor all the time. That's the way he thought. And so I picked up on it by, you might call it, osmosis, just by being around him. But I didn't know that I was picking up on it because I hated to see him coming, like I said, because I'd never been around anybody like that all the time, a person who was that way all the time, and who enjoyed being that way. That was what you call normal for him. He wasn't straining to be that way. To him, was relaxing. So when I started picking up on just a little bit of it, I became more relaxed. I say, yeah, not being confused does relax you. But I discovered that. I didn't know that. I didn't never thought about it. I say, yeah, the less confused you are, meaning the more you know why something is going on, who, what, when, where, why, how. The more you know these things, the more relaxed you are, because the less confused you are. That's what relaxes you. Yes, sir. Rather than being jittery like Barney Fife. Hmm. Okay. Hope nobody calls you Barney. <laughs> anyway, let's go to the 832 and Johnny, or John, excuse me. From Houston, John, I believe you are on. There you go. You're on with Mr. Fuller. Good morning, and what is your question? Good morning, Mr. Bobby, and good morning, Mr. Fuller. I'm good morning, you, sir. That, but my grandfather was called John. However, oh, okay. uh, just so it, there's some interesting anecdotal. Uh, as I'm listening to the uh, memory, I guess you could say reminiscing from you, Mr. Fuller, not just the bar, Barney Fife. Uh, anecdote or analogy, I guess you could say. But the one that was really getting me was about the Terrapin. And when I tried to ask you last about who's an American, I was trying in my maybe failing way to explain what is called Turtle Island. And certainly listening to you talk about the Terrapin, which is of the Turtle family, kind of reinforced to me what this place was called before Europe, what we call European colonial invasion. Now, there are people who some would call themselves an African Moor or what we inaccurately call a European Caucasian who have come to my homeland, and I'm talking in the way that we're trying to redefine ourselves, and certainly the way I just listened to you talk about reduced confusion. We have been mislabeled and misidentified of the only specific population, I would argue, in the entire history of the world, not just in our current contemporary times. We have so many names that have been placed upon us by others. 
And that was what I was attempting to do in redefining what was an American first. Secondly, the fact of the matter remains that all these immigrant groups who can be shown to be obviously not from here, that is what is causing much of our confusion. And I will put it this way, of what I feel is our identity crisis. Now, confusion is not only the, you think you said, the handmaiden of, of unintelligence or, or being incompetent, let's say. It is also the handmaiden or the partner of chaos. And the confusion that is perpetuated on people who are called Negro colored, black, and African American is to convince us we are other than the descendants of the original first people of Turtle Island. In the War Department of Colonial America, there is much documented evidence and proof of who these people were, what they called themselves, and what they identifiably called and respect each other, which is called the Niji, N-I-I-J-I. So the question I'm asking you in listening to those two examples you used about the Terrapin, which is symbolic of Turtle Island, and about Barney Fife, which is the author of Confusion, as an analogy, is that the only way we will get to moving towards, as you say, producing justice, dismantling white supremacy, is to come to some clarity on who we are. So last week I asked you was who's the American. This week I'm going to ask you is who is the descendant of the original inhabitants of what is purposely misidentified as North America or Turtle Island. And, Mr. Bobby, I'd like to hold on to here because I can't hear him off air. Oh, Thank okay. you for the time, and have a wonderful day. All righty. Uh, Mr. Well, Miller? Uh, I don't know these details at all. I'm not even familiar with them. But then I never thought that I needed to know once I latched on to one thing, and that is asking the broader question, what is my history? What is Neely Fuller's history? That's what I ask myself, because all problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. So I just broaden it by saying, hey, I'm just going to go for the broad field. Neely Fuller has a history. So what is the history of Neely Fuller? Now, according to what I've written in the textbook, and it's the most accurate response and the most constructive response that I have come up with so far, if someone throws me some type of hint, no, there's a better response, I'll adopt it. If I evaluate it and see that it is a better response. But here's my codified response to history, period. Neely Fuller Jr.'s history is as follows. Everything that ever happened before the beginning of time and since. And that is the truth. The first thing I want is, if I make that statement, is it true? And I came to the conclusion after thinking about it and giving that type of answer, yes, that's the truth. Now, the next thing I want to know is, because the truth is supposed to be used for something, does this satisfy my requirements for whatever it is that I'm going to do after I say that? Start with the truth about Neely Fuller's history. Everything that ever happened before the beginning of time and since the beginning of time is Neely Fuller's history. Why? Because there are things that happen. before the beginning of time, I guess, in order for time to come into existence. And since that happened before I got here, whatever being here means, it's my history because it happened before. History means before, before, before my existence. And everything that has happened after my existence right to this very moment. That's history. This second right now, this split second, right this minute, is history. 
It's here. It's gone. It's here. It's gone. It's here. It's gone. Just like that. That's my history. Every rock that ever turned over on the moon after 14 trillion centuries of sitting there is my history. Now, you might say, well, yeah, but you don't know it. Well, what do you know about a rock turning over on the moon or a speck of dust that's circling Venus right now? How many specks of dust are circling Venus right now, Fuller? And so if you ask me, do I know my history? The answer is no. No way <laughs> do I know my history. I know what was happening before the beginning of time. Everything that happened before the beginning of time, when I don't even know what time looks like before time existed, or what it looks like now for that matter. Looking at a clock is something that people made, and that's what you call people time. But is that really time? That's a question. Does that clock, and I'm looking at one right now, does that really tell me that what it says is time? Is that really time? Or is that somebody that somebody said it's somebody who somebody who somebody else said it? who somebody else said, who somebody else said, is time. And who were the somebodies? And where did they get their information? And what has that got to do with before time? Did time begin when they made that clock? I don't think so. So they say, well, this measures time. Does it measure all the time? that came before the clock was made? Does that clock do that? And if it does, tell me how to tell it. Can I look at that clock and tell what was happening before the beginning of time? See, it's all kind of questions can be raised. So it comes down to this one thing. Well, you got some time and you got some energy. That's one, two things you know you got, whatever you call it, whatever definition. And you're supposed to be using it. Using it for what? To correct things that need correcting. And what needs correcting more than anything else, Fuller? What's right in front of me? What's right in front of you, Fuller? Something called racism. It needs to be changed into something called justice. That's my assignment. Okay. Assignment. From the chat room. And by the way, thank you, uh, John from Houston, and you are, I'll keep you there. From the chat room, Be Good One says, please ask Mr. Fuller what was his experience growing up during the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma in the 1930s? My experience is that I heard about the Dust Bowl in northern Oklahoma, because that's where it mostly took place, northwestern Oklahoma up near what they call, if you look at a map, the Panhandle area. Now, where I was was near the Muskogee, Oklahoma. is down near the, old, the lower chain of the Ozark Mountains, I had been told. And so, where you have mountains, mountains catch water. And where you have water, on the top of mountains when it melts. It goes down and to the bottom of the mountains. That's what water does. Water on top of a mountain in the form of ice. And if it forms up there, if it rains, the mountains catch the water and it forms what you call little rivulets that turn into rivers. And the rivers flow down into the valleys, and you can grow stuff, and the ground becomes wet at the bottom of the mountains. So in eastern Oklahoma, you did have some forests, not many, but you had trees growing. You see some greenery, 
at the time I was coming up, most of Oklahoma looks like it was made up of short brown grass. I tend to believe that hasn't changed. Most Oklahoma is short brown grass, and that many of the rivers, sometimes creeks and whatnot, dry up so that you can walk across them, really. I've seen that myself. That's the way it was when I was growing up. But now the dust storms, like you see in some of the pictures, those huge clouds of ominous dust, looks like the world is coming to an end. That was going on in northwestern Oklahoma, up near the Panhandle. We heard about it. But most of the dust, it seems like, it blew to the northeast, out of Oklahoma. And it went into other places. And it was it was awful. It was literally like the world was coming to an end. And a lot of people associated with Oklahoma with bad luck, period. This is one reason Andrew Jackson wanted to send all the Indians there and did what he called the five civilized tribes because he said it's worthless land. But then they found out that the land was worthless when it comes to growing stuff. But But, up under there was oil. Oh, as oil. Yes, sir. And here they came again. Yep. (laughs) Okay. All right, be good one. There you go. Mr. Fuller did answer your question here. You're listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., also called the CRCS. You can get in contact with the show by dialing 516-453-9921. You can press or depress <laughs> the number one button if you'd like to make a call or comment. Please, ma'am, please, sir, please, please, please keep it short so that Mr. Fuller can address it. Okay, let's go to Long Beach. You know who that is, Marcus. You're on with Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir, and what is your question? Good morning, gentlemen. Nice to talk to you guys again this morning. I'm still learning. Uh, My Uh, question is, uh, since the evidence can support that the system of white supremacy has produced the most amount of material benefits and has excelled at doing just that, do you think, Mr. Fuller, that those material benefits make other victims of racism comfortable with the current system? Um, I ask that because a growing number of non-white athletes who I consider, you know, well-financed victims of racism are speaking out or wanting to speak out against racism, but the majority are always are always say, quote, unquote, it's not the right place or the right time while a non-white athlete is being mistreated by racism. And the ones who do speak out are um, – met with, you know, verbal or physical mistreatment sometimes in ways. So, yeah, um, do you think that since this current system has produced those material benefits and everyone is, you know, is comfortable with that, that makes people not want to speak about or speak up about, you know, the, the mistreatment that we do have? Well, different people have different perspectives on what's going on around them. But the code says... I'm duty-bound not to agree with or disagree with anything that another victim of racism, another prisoner of war, race war, says about race, racism, and our counter-racism. It's called VGQ, Victims Guaranteed Qualification. Anything that some athlete or whomever, the person is black, the person is classified as non-white, whatever they say about racism, if they say they agree with the racists, like some black people say that, hey, I got no problem with what uh, those people did up on Capitol Hill who said that they are white supremacists and whatnot. I'm black. I got no problem with that. Freedom of speech. I mean, let them do it. In fact, some of them are telling the truth. So that's all. I'm with them on that. I'm with them on this. 
And the other black people will get mad. I don't. The code doesn't allow me to because they are qualified to do that simply by being victims. That's what victims guaranteed qualification means. We need that, in my opinion. That's something that I invented. Invented for what reason? It's a compensatory thing. Compensatory meaning what? That we need it, I think. That's why I invented it. Because I came to the conclusion that black people arguing about what other black people say or don't say about race, racism, or counter-racism, I found out it didn't matter no way. Of course, the white supremacists are going to make the decisions about what they're going to do or not do anyhow, anyway. So what a prisoner, one prisoner of war getting up in the morning and stretching says about his or her condition as a prisoner. Some might say, I like it here. What y'all complaining about? And the other prisoners get mad. But I say, no. <laughs> what difference does it make? I mean, he's still there. He's a prisoner. All prisoners are equal. See, so I don't have any comment on that. He said what he said to say that. He said what he said. In the case of a female, she said what she said. I'll give an example. If somebody asks me what a prominent black person said on TV the other day, like it happens all the time, about anything dealing with race or racism, and saying that they recommend this and they recommend that. And somebody asked me, well, what do you have to say about it? Just like I'm being asked now about what the athletes are saying. I'm saying he said what he said. Because that's what the code, this is in the code book. He said what he said. Well, what do you think about what he said? I think that he said what he said. See, I'm duty bound not to say anything else. That's why we need a code. And why do I say that? Why do I give that kind of response? Because it doesn't matter anyway. If I give a response saying I agree or I disagree, what does that mean? And I'm a fellow prisoner. I don't have any power. So my agreement or disagreement doesn't mean anything, except I'm going to get a big argument out of somebody. And what do I need with that? Nothing. Because that's where it leads to. Black people arguing among themselves. It's like a bunch of prisoners in the bottom of the slave ship arguing about whose chains are shinier than others. My chains are shinier than yours. I like my chains. And the other person say, you're a fool. You like chains? Yeah, because they're pretty. Yeah. Now everybody gets mad. But after they get mad, so what? They're still on a slave ship, all of them. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't matter. That's the point that I'm making. It doesn't matter. Yes. yes, sir. One black person's opinion of what another black person said about race does not matter at all. All righty. There you go, Marcus. Do not be a stranger. Let's do this. You are listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neil A. Fuller Jr. here on blogtalkradio.com. I believe the show will also be on Mr. Fuller's podcast on um, at producejustice.com. So you can uh, access the information that has been dispensed on this show there. To get in contact with this show this day, just simply dial 516 516- Four five three nine nine two one, and make sure that you push or press or depress the number one button so that you can be heard with your question or comment, VGQ. Please, ma'am, please, sir, please, 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 please make it short so that Mr. Fuller can answer the question. You can also gmail me at the numeral seven Mr. Bobby B O B B Y at Gmail dot com and I will get that. By the way, when you do call in, please be sure to give your name to the call screener 
as Ishmael from Chicago has done and Helen B. from the great state of New York has done. Please be sure to do that so that I can properly introduce you. Chat room is also uh, open. Okay, let's go on here to the uh, final segment of today's program, today being June the 8th. Mr. Fuller, uh, this is from a Gmailer. Mr. Fuller, can you explain uh, from your knowledge how or why the white supremacists use the word vanilla for deception? Vanilla is very dark in color, but when people think vanilla, they think white, pure and normal, or standard in terms of food. They use the word vanilla to describe normal, non-degrading sex. Vanilla is dark in color, but used to describe everything white in a positive way. Mr. Fuller, please, if you have any thoughts on this, could you please share? Well, there's a there's a standard saying in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. To the extent that a white supremacist has anything to do with it, it is to make the system of white supremacists stronger. Because that's what the white supremacists do. That's why they're strong. The white supremacists don't do anything. No matter how it looks on the surface. They don't say anything and they don't do anything except those things that are going to make the system of white supremacy stronger than it already is, and or keep the strength that it has acquired. That's the compensatory counter-racist assumption that is proven to be correct. That's why white supremacy is still here. That's why everybody is trying to figure out who calls themselves against racism, how to go about doing it. It's put together very scientifically, in a scientific manner, and uh, it works. It's a code. So any words that they use, they use the word vanilla. They use the word fair. Fair is sometimes associated with the word justice that I started to talk about earlier in this program. And maybe if the white supremacist is using the word vanilla, you can expect them to use the word in such a way that it helps a person to think in terms of strengthening the system of white supremacy, either directly or indirectly. That's why the word dark is associated with just about everything in the Washington Post newspaper on every issue every morning I looked at it this morning democracy dies in darkness that's the standard saying everything dark including people with dark skin evidently is something that is poisonous, even though most of the universe is dark. They even have what you call black holes in the blackness. <laughs> the hole is black, and inside of the hole is more blackness that that even generates more blackness and more blackness and more blackness. And according to what some scientists say, you come anywhere near it, it pulls everything that's got light in it into it, and it disappears. And they say it comes out where? They don't know. Maybe there is no coming out. And what does all that mean? That when you look up at a night sky, that the night sky is black or dark. And then it gets darker. And then it gets darker. And then somewhere in all that darkness, you have something that is blacker than black. Now think about that. Blacker than black. How are you going to get blacker than black? But 
there is blacker than black. And then it keeps getting blacker and blacker than blacker than blacker. And they call them black holes. It's a black hole within a black hole, within another black hole, within another black hole. This is in the universe. They say they're all over the place. But they say, what are they other than black holes? Or what's the significance of them? And last report I've heard, nobody knows what they're trying to figure out. And they say and it pulls energy, any type of energy anywhere in the universe, whatever energy is, that happens to come anywhere close to one of these black holes, these black holes will pull it in there, and it disappears. But what is that all about? And they say, and it probably means that somewhere, whatever pulled into it, goes out somewhere. But out where? Into another black hole? The universe is a mystery. Hmm. Like solving the problem of white supremacy is a mystery. Until what? Until you ask enough questions about how to get rid of it and replace it with justice. That's what. (laughs) Okay. Let's go to the 405, and that would be in Chi-Town. We have Ishmael. Ishmael, good morning. You're on with Mr. Fuller. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Uh, I have a, I guess it was a question I want to proceed with. Uh, a little idea. Um, I want to know, does Mr. Fuller believe or can he acknowledge possibly that possibly it's not exactly racism we're dealing with. It's inner species warfare. As in the animal kingdom, you see the different birds fighting each other. Um, And whereas there will be no humans around the world if black people didn't walk out of Africa and conquer these other groups of man. Um, And this could be also just a reverse trend of that. We're in the word is not so much racism, but we might be dealing with interspecies warfare at this time. And I want to know uh, Mr. Uh, Fuller's thoughts on that. Well, I always say the dominant factor and that's why I wrote the book, is a system of white supremacy. And I also just don't talk about, and I recommend that people just don't talk about white supremacy exists, and white supremacy exists, and white supremacy exists, and just keep talking about it like that forever. But also, one of the reasons, the main reason I wrote the book I tried to write a book about what to do about it. And the first thing is to change the way you talk about it. And here in 2021, I say, you got to find out what white people want. That's the first order of business, which is something that looks like nobody is doing. Nobody's doing that. And a lot of black people are, you know, for some reason, seem like they're afraid to find out and have black people or white people tell them what they want, what white people want, not what black people want. Black people always say what they want, you know, even though we are very vague about it. We use vague terms like freedom, like, you know, we want justice without describing what we mean by that. Uh, We want a better life. We got all kind of slogans about what we want, but we're short on giving details because giving details get scary. Scary to whom? Black people, because if everybody starts talking about what they want and what they don't want in detail, black people don't want to hear from white people, which is what is absolutely necessary. And we're gonna, gonna if we're gonna it. really get serious about this, we have to in every conference, rather than sit around and start talking about abstractions like love and all well we got to love each other 
and we got to care for each other. These are nice slogans, but get into the details. What does the average white person want when they interact with a black person in economics, in education, in entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, and then when you get to that eighth area activity, I mean, real go into real specifics, sex, all right, particularly when it comes to reproduction. Are we talking about that? Because that's on a lot of white people's minds when they're saying, I'm taking my daughter out of that school because the neighborhood is changing. What do they mean by that? I'm taking my daughter out of that school because the neighborhood is changing. Now, that's code language, meaning black people are moving in. Black people moving into the neighborhood, neighborhood change, mean you're going to bring black males sitting next to my white daughter. Next thing you know, his black hands are going to be on her. Okay? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what white people want. Do they want that? Do they want a little black baby, all right, as a granddaughter or a grandson? Okay, these are the kind of questions that should come up right now, right this minute in every classroom. But black people dodge it and white people dodge it. Why? Because it's dynamite, that's why. Codification is about, hey, getting right into the mix, I mean, and, and right off the bat, go for the hard questions. I mean the hard questions, the things that all the black intellectuals dodge. I mean, let, let's hit it. Let's hit it right now, right this minute, in every classroom within the sound of my voice. That's what codification is about, slam dunks. Let's wrap this thing up. But you got to do it without shouting, without cursing, without name calling. But just find out what everybody wants. Most black people, when you nail them, because I've heard it, we don't really know what we want. Except we want some changes. And that's how we say it. We say it. We really say what we want. And what we say really indicates we really don't know. We want some changes made. Well, what kind of changes, Negro? We'll do something. Something like what, Negro? Well, there's something different from what y'all doing, because y'all ain't doing right. Okay, right meaning what, Negro? Well, uh, 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 let me scratch my head for a minute or two. You've been doing that forever. Get into the details. That's where it is, folks. Details. I mean the rough details. Your black hands on my white daughter. Is that what I want as a white person? And you going into it with your black phallus and producing these half-white babies, is that what I want as a white person? Yes or no? This should be asked. I'm talking about something like in the fifth grade. But there ain't nobody asking those kind of questions. We're tiptoeing. And codification is not about tiptoeing about nothing. Because you can't settle no kind of truth or make any kind of progress in anything without facing the truth and going right to the juggler vein every time. Skip all that little sad stuff and go for the real important stuff right out of the bat. Mm-hmm. Okay. All righty. All right, Ishmael. Um, thank you so much, brother, for your uh, question here. All righty, let's do it right here. Let's go to the 631. That would be Helen B. from New York. Good morning, Helen. Hello, good morning. Can I be heard? Good morning, Helen. <laughs> oh, hi. Can you hear me? Can I be heard? Yes, yes ma'am. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Hi. 
Okay. Hi. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. I'm part of a book club, and I want to know if it was correct or incorrect, constructive or non-constructive, to talk about Area 9 in the book club as a group, or should we do it individually? That's my quick question. The question is, the ninth area of activity on war, war, yes, but on war. Mecca. Yeah, but on oh. Mecca specifically, should it be discussed as a group oh, or should it be uh, you done individually? Do you always do everything as an individual. You don't look over your shoulder to see who's around or nothing. You just go for the truth. That's how I use the textbook. See, if I'm working on a job and they're going to have a meeting and they say it's going to be volatile and all like that and it's going to be a lot of hot things discussed and somebody might get fired and all like that, I mean, during the time I had my textbook, I would just say, hey, I'll just, you know, my first 1984 edition, uh, I'd cover up the cover so I don't alarm nobody. I'm on the job if I had the book on the job and I was going to use it or read from it or something like that, I'd just take it with me. And I don't look to see who's in the meeting or anything like that. I just come right out of the book. That's what a code is for. See what I mean? You don't think about groups of people. You don't even think about, you know, well, I got to check and see if so-and-so is here and say so-and-so is there. How many black people are here going to be with me? Or how many black people are going to be against me? Because we're going to have the meeting. See, if you got a code, you don't need none of that. All you need is the code. And you come straight out of the code in everything that you say. And it will take you right where you need to be. And it doesn't make no difference who's at the meeting. You don't have to check and see what their title is and all that. See, that's what black people are used to. Well, now, we got to be all together now, you know, because if so-and-so don't show up, then we can't have the meeting because, you know, he know, he, he knows how to talk, you know. And if so-and-so shows up, well, we better not have the meeting because, you know, he's going to say something, you know, that they ain't going to like. I mean, and that's going to reflect on us and then. See, that's black people. See, a code eliminates the need for all of that. They even consider any of that. You just say, hey, I'm going in there with the code. I don't care who's there. I don't care what their name is, where they came from, where they're going, nothing. I'm going to come straight out of the code on every question. I'm going to concentrate on the questions and answers because that's all I'm I'm, – everything I'm going to be dealing with is questions and answers. Hmm. Okay. Um, Helen B., did you say that you were a member of a book club and you were discussing this or trying to or going to or what? Yes, I'm a member of a book club, and we are discussing um, the compensatory. Mr. Millie Fuller's book as a group, um, it's a bunch of non-white people, and, yeah, we discuss it as a group. But when you came to the ninth theory, you were asking Mr. Fuller, as a book club group or member, should that area be discussed? So that I can understand, was that your question? Yes, I was. I was asking if it should be discussed as a group or should we do uh-huh. it individually? Would it be constructive, non-constructive, incorrect, or correct to do it as a group, or should we just separate at that part let's of the book and, and do it individually? Stop. Okay, let's stop and think. What is exactly is a group? Because now I have some questions that you have kindled in my mind. Am I in a group now? I think I'm in a world yes. group. I'm in a group of listeners. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I, and you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm on the air, but I'm doing what? What did I say a few minutes ago? I'm coming straight out of the code. See, well, I don't know who's present in the group. All of the audience now, I've been told at the beginning of this program, there are people who are listening to me right now who are in what they call South Africa. I don't know who's listening. I have been told also that there are white people who listen, but they don't call. But they listen. Now, the code says, you better believe it is anything worth listening to. And... 
the white supremacists will determine that because they check on black people and see what they're doing every now and then. They don't have to check as a regular thing because black people usually do the same things over and over again. And the white supremacists rely on that. And that's usually something that's useless, which is why we are in the shape that we're in. We don't change very much, fundamentally. Hmm. We are wedded to what we call black culture. And the white supremacists love black culture the way it is now. Because Hmm. black culture is nowhere the way it should be now. Uh But the white supremacists approve of it. All righty. Helen B., thank you for your question. Let's quickly, and don't be a stranger, by the way, let's quickly go to London, England. I believe that's what it says here. And we have Trey. Trey, you are now on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Uh, good evening, Bobby. Good evening, uh, Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr. Uh, my question um, comes from what I heard uh, Neely Fuller, Jr. say earlier about we have to um, – ask white people what they want in order to uh, come closer to uh, producing justice. So my question to Lily Fuller is, um, what do you think white people want? Um, Right now, they want the system of white supremacy, but there are a lot of white people who march with black people. Uh, You know, the Black Lives Matter, they say it's a different thing. But it all comes down to what the people want. So the best way to find out, see, I don't think about what white people want in that context. I go according to the code. I find out what white people want by doing what? The logical thing. Asking them not only what they want, the white people of the world, to say truthfully what they want and something else what they don't want in regards to their relationships with black people. And black people got to get around to this and stop dancing around it the way I see it, according to the code. Because it gets to the truth, and it gets to problem solving. And then the black people tell specifically in every area of activity what we want for white people, the white people of this planet. We've got to be very, very uh, 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 detailed about that, what we want and what we don't want in order to have a quality relationship. That's what the code calls it, a quality hmm. relationship. We've never had it. We don't. Black people don't have a quality relationship with each other. Which is why the code says we shouldn't even contact each other unless we have something constructive to say so that everything that we do and say turns out to be constructive. Black people can't have a party, and you've got to guarantee that it's going to be constructive. I read on the, I pick up the paper almost every day. Black people in Chicago deciding, well, the COVID-19 thing is kind of weaned off, so let's have a party. So they have a party, and what do I see in the paper the next day? Gunshots. Seven-year-old girl shot in the chest. Stray bullet. Black people's party. So now, is that constructive? The answer is no. So then it says, what's the purpose in having a party? If this is what the result is going to be. We don't learn anything. And when we learn, we just say, well, that's what it is. And let's do it again. Uh, wow. The code says stop doing anything where you get that kind of result. Period. Just Period. stop it. Yeah. If you can't have a party without shooting, stop having parties. Period. Gotcha. We need exact. We need to be exact about everything and stop playing. Stop like the, playing. Like yes, like like the childlike status that the white supremacists are always saying. They say. Black people never grow up. They get to be seven years old, and even when they're 50, they're still seven years old. And you know what? They are talking like they're telling the truth. Okay. All books and materials 
that are mentioned on this show can be accessed through going to ProduceJustice.com. That's ProduceJustice.com. One more time, ProduceJustice.com. Last call of the day. Let's go to SWA in Los Angeles, and you're on, sir. Last question. Go ahead, sir. Um, Greg, just a quick VGQ. Um, greetings, Mr. Bobby. Greetings, Mr. Nibby Fuller. Um, uh, I'm part of this book club, and um, every week we meet to discuss uh, a portion of the code, and this is open for any victims of racism who want to um, learn more about code and attempt to practice it. And um, tomorrow, um, it's every Wednesday at 3 p.m. PST, um, we're discussing pages 360, um, 359 to 369. You can email um, counteringrws at gmail.com to um, participate. Um, and that's my um, GQ. Hey, hey, before you go, you're talking about Mr. Fuller's book. Is that correct? Yes, the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. Okay, hey, yes. what, what are those pages again? Um, 359 to 369. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much, brother. You know better. You don't have to be a stranger. Okay. Thank you, Swa. Mr. Fuller, you're on for the next couple of minutes. Um, we give you this right here. Oh, b- by the way, don't forget, Mr. Fuller has mentioned make a will, and you can get some information on how to be a good exeter by Sharon Walters from the Your Money section of the May edition of AARP Bulletin, page 26. Mr. Fuller, the next few moments are yours. Go ahead, please, sir. Okay. I'd just like to reiterate what I've been saying, uh, maybe in a not the best way, uh, about I do talk about the wants in uh, previous talks. And like I said, I'd like to emphasize, because we really need this now. If we're really going to get away from just slogans, we shall overcome Black Lives Matter, uh, come by uh, uh, the whole nine yards of what we usually do. Let's get into the details, because we're going to have to find out what white people want. The white people who say they want something different from what we have now. Okay. So how do they want that picture to look? The white people of the world. And go for the hardest questions first. The hardest questions are going to deal with sex. Because traditionally, black people were lynched. (coughs) Black males Mm -hmm. were lynched. Just thinking about looking at a picture of a white woman. All right? So this is still deep-seated and a lot of white people throughout the entire world, and for a logical reason. And white people will sometimes give that logical reason. It's a logical reason. They'll say, well, if you mix, if you have a black person have sexual intercourse with enough white people, the next thing you know, you don't have no white people. And they are correct about that. That's a biological fact. So we should talk about that. I mean, talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and come to some type of agreement because what they're saying is white people are worth preserving as white people. Blue-eyed, blonde-haired people don't need to become no dark-skinned, black-haired, black-eyed people. Hmm. We want blue-eyed people and blonde people. Why not? We got them. Why don't we keep them? We can't keep them if we're going to be mixing with you all in bed. That's just a biological fact. Let's face it. Let's talk about it. So we can talk about that. We can say, okay, we preserve uh, sparrows. We preserve robins, uh, different type of ducks. We just don't have one type of duck. We got all kinds of ducks. Got to leave it there, Mr. Fuller. I am so sorry because we are out of time. Thank everybody for listening. Excuse excuse me if I made any mistakes, but that's going to happen. But thank you for listening to Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr. and the Counter-Racist Code Show right here. Thank you. See you next week.